most important event in human history. It is the deciding factor in your lives, in my life, personally. On the basis of whether we accept or reject the resurrection of Jesus stands our eternal destiny. If you accept the resurrection of Jesus, we know what lies ahead for us. A place that the Father has prepared eternal life with Him. We also know if you reject the resurrection, deny it, that hell and eternal condemnation waits upon you. The resurrection, the most important thing in life. This week I read an article about the resurrection. It was an article on an apologetics blog, and it was talking about evidence or proof of the resurrection. And it had a quote from a man named Thomas Arnold. Thomas Arnold was a historian and professor at Cambridge. And he was a noted historian. And, and what he specialized in doing in certain periods, certain eras in history, he would go back and he would study primarily the source material of that era. And he would come up with a history on that basis. He wouldn't necessarily read what other modern historians say, but he would go back to the source material. And he made this comment about the resurrection based upon his experience as a historian. Listen to what he said. He said, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. Now listen to the next part. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God hath given us, that Christ died and rose again from the dead. A noted historian, he said, I know of no other fact that's so fully accounted for that if you look at it, you will see it. We know that there's proof of the resurrection. We know that there's so much testimony. There's so many things that point towards it being true, that points to its validity. But folks, tonight I'm not going to get up here and preach an apologetic sermon. I'm not going to get up here and, and show you all the proofs of it, show you all the evidence of it. What I want to talk about tonight is hope gleaned from the resurrection. The resurrection is true, and I, I know that you believe that or you would not be here tonight. It is true, and there's hope that we gain by trusting, by believing in the resurrection. Take your Bible, if you would, and open it to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. The title of this message is Hope Gleaned from the Resurrection. Hope Gleaned from the Resurrection. And the title is self-explanatory of what we're going to do. We're going to see what hope we have on the basis of understanding, believing, trusting in the resurrection. I'm going to do what I did this morning. We're going to be covering most of chapter 24. Chapter 24 has 53 verses. That's a little bit long for me to read. So what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to pull up different passages, different verses as I go through my sermon. But what I am going to do before I, I do that, before I go into the sermon, is to give you an overview of the chapter, to lay out for you what takes place in chapter 24. But before I can even do that, we need to ask the Lord's blessing upon this service. Let's pray together. Our Father, Lord, we come before you. and Lord, we are so grateful to be able to enter into your presence. And Lord, right now, collectively as a body of believers, we just want to praise you for the resurrection. Father, we thank you that Jesus did not remain in the tomb, that the tomb is empty, and that by your power you raised him and now he's at your right hand. And, Father, we praise you for that, and we thank you because of what it means for us. Because the resurrection is real, we have hope. We have strength for today, hope for the future, assurance of eternal life, hope of our own resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for what we have by the raising up of Jesus. Father, I want to pray tonight, and, Lord, uh, I pray that you'd help me to preach your word. Lord, you know I'm weary. You know I'm tired, Lord. But, Father, I, I'm going to claim what your word says. I think of what the Apostle Paul said when he prayed the three times that that thorn in the flesh would be removed. You didn't remove it. 
But you did give him this word. You said your grace is sufficient. You said that power is perfected in weakness. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that tonight. That your power would be made manifest in my weakness, Lord. Lord God, I just pray that you would anoint me. That you would give me the words to say that I would decrease, but Christ would increase in my life and through this message. And Lord, I pray for those who are here tonight. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would touch them. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would show them the hope that they have that no matter what happens in this life, because of the resurrection of Jesus, there's hope for us. Help us, Lord, to hang on to that. Father God, be with us in this service. And Lord God, then as we turn and as we partake of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you would be glorified in it. I pray, Lord, that even now you would be preparing our hearts, Lord, for that solemn celebration as we think of the new covenant. Be with us tonight, Father. I ask this in Christ's name, for his sake, amen. All right, I'm not going to read chapter 24, but I do need to give you a layout of this chapter. Any of you ever been to a play before? I've been to a play. Plays are divided up into what? Acts and scenes. Think of Luke chapter 24 as consisting of three major scenes. First, you have the women who go to the tomb the first day of the week. They go disheartened. They go in distress. They're going to finish the burial preparation of Jesus. But when they get there, they are in for the surprise, the shock of their lives. The stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty save for two angels who tell them that, tell them that Jesus is risen. That's act one. Act two, the scene shifts. We see a group of Jesus' followers. They're walking down a road. They're making their way they're on the road to Emmaus. As they're walking, someone journeys with them. It's Jesus, but they don't recognize him. They begin to talk of all that's been happening. They talk about uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. They talk about the rumors of a resurrection. Jesus comes to them there and begins to, to listen to them, to hear them talk. And then, you know what he does? He takes the entire Old Testament, says from Moses to the prophets, and he preaches himself. And he said that he had to suffer, he had to die, and he had to be raised from the dead. And in verse 32, I think it is, it says that when he did that, that when he preached that, that their hearts burned within them. They had hope from the resurrection. And then it shifts to a final scene. The disciples, they're gathered in the upper room there at Jerusalem. At Jerusalem, they've just participated in the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper just a few days before. They're worried, disheartened, confused, thinking about all the rumors, thinking about everything that's going on. Boom, there's Jesus. He's in the room with them. They see the wounds. They see the scar. They know it's him. Proves the resurrection. Today we're going to take this chapter and we're going to think about the hope that we have, hope gleaned from the resurrection. What's the first hope that we have? Because that the resurrection of Jesus, it confirms his claim. The resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms all the claims that he makes in his gospel. The resurrection of Jesus Christ made him the son of God.
Don't you remember way back at the beginning of his ministry? Don't you remember in Galilee what Jesus said all along? That he had to be delivered under the chief priest. That he would be betrayed. That he would be arrested. That he would be condemned. That he would be crucified. That he would die. But then he would be raised. He says, don't you remember? You know what happened to those ladies that day when that was said? They gained assurance about all the claims that Jesus made. Their minds went back to every single thing that Jesus said, every claim that he made, and they said, if this tomb is empty, if he's raised, if these angels are here, that means that every last claim is true. Is true. Folks, the same thing is true today. The resurrection confirms, verifies, all the claims that Jesus made about himself. Well, what, did, what claims did Jesus make? Well, think through this with me. I want you to think about some of the claims that Jesus made and how the resurrection verified him. The first and most important claim that Jesus made, he claimed to be God. Now, you'll watch some History Channel documentaries. You'll watch stuff on A&E. And you'll have this noted scholar with the alphabet soup after their name. And they're at this uh, institution of higher learning. And they'll say, no. Jesus never made that claim. That was something adopted by his followers after that. Jesus never made that claim. His followers did that, and then the church adopted it, and it spread throughout the church, and that's what we have today. Well, that's hogwash. It's hogwash. I know I'm in Razorback country, but it's hogwash. It's, it's hogwash. Jesus did claim to be God. If somebody comes up to you and they ask you that, let me show you some, a surefire way that you can prove it, something that, that's so easy from Scripture, you take them to the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, there are approximately, give or take, some people say more, seven I am sayings by Jesus. You know some of them? He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says, I am the gate, I am the door, I am the bread of life. All of those sayings, he's doing something very, very significant. He is making the claim to be the great I am. Remember how God identified himself to Moses when he called him? And Moses said, who am I going to say sent me, Lord? When they ask me, who sent me? Who am I going to say? What did the Lord say? I am that I am. Every time Jesus uses one of those I am statements, those I am sayings in God, he is relating it back to to Moses and his audience got that they would have understood that in their mind he is claiming to be the great I am he is claiming to be God that's what he was doing he made the claim to be God now is that true there's a lot of folks have come along before and since that have made that claim is it not a lot of folks that claim to be God what makes D Jesus different well how many of them are raised from the dead <laughs> that changes things that makes the claims real. That verifies the claim that he is God. Another claim that he made, oh boy, this is my favorite. He claimed to have the power to forgive sin. Praise God. He made that claim and praise God that it's real. Jesus, on many different occasions, in many different ways, made the claim that he had the power to forgive sin. I think about John chapter 8. I was reading that this week. The woman caught in the very act of adultery. Remember, the chief priests, the rulers, they bring her to Jesus. What are we going to do with her? Trying to trick, we're going to stone her. What did Jesus say? First one that's without sin, you, you cast the first stone, you do it. But then what did he say to the woman? It's in verse 11 of John chapter 8. He asked him where, where these men were that condemned him. She said, There's, they're gone. Remember what Jesus said? I don't condemn you either. That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness. Was that claim to forgive sin real? Did that woman really have forgiveness? Yes. How do I know the tomb is empty? Raised from the dead. It verifies who he is. It verifies the claim. And do you know what that means today for us? If you're in sin, if you are lost, you can come to Jesus and have forgiveness. If you're contrite, if you're repentant when you come to Christ, because of that resurrection, the claim to forgive sin is real, and you can have forgiveness. Praise God. Another claim that he made that's confirmed by the resurrection, he claimed to have the power to judge. In many different ways, many different statements, many different times, he claimed to have that authority to judge. Let me give you just one example. 
Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, the Great Commission. Know what he says in verse 18? All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Now, a lot of people have come along, and they've claimed to have uh, the authority to forgive sin. They've claimed to have the power to judge. What makes Jesus different? When Jesus spoke those words, the disciples are looking at him. And they're looking at one who was once dead, but now living. If that won't verify a claim, I don't know what will. He has the power to judge. Folks, have you recognized that the claims of Jesus are real? That he is God? That he has the power to forgive sin? Not just any sin. He can forgive your sin. Have you recognized that by the resurrection, that means that he has the power to judge, and one day he will come back in judgment and in seeing all those things have you gone to Jesus have you gone to him I hope and pray that you have another hope that we have from the resurrection another thing that we see here is not only does the resurrection confirm the claims of Jesus but the resurrection comforts the conflicted comforts the conflicted now we've talked about scene one or act one when um it takes place there at the tomb. The stone is rolled away. The ladies go there. They see the angels and they have that encounter. Now let's go to the second part. This group of Jesus' followers, they're making their way. They're on the road to Emmaus. And we see this in verses 13 to 35. They're, they're walking. And what do you do when you travel somewhere? We don't walk a lot of places, but we ride. What do you do when you're riding with somebody? You talk. You talk about things. And they're talking about what's on their heart, what's on their mind. Jesus has been crucified it's been several days before and now there's this rumor that these ladies are spreading we went to the tomb and it was empty what's more we went to the tomb and there were angels they're talking about all of these things and as they're walking here's Jesus they don't recognize him at first but he's there and they begin to dialogue they begin to talk about What's going on? Jesus asked them in verse 19, what things are you, are you talking about? And they explain about Jesus, about who he was. And I want to call your attention to one verse. Look at verse 21. This breaks my heart, what they say. Look at verse 21. They're talking to Jesus uh, about what has happened to him. And listen to the statement that they made. It said, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Do you hear the anguish in their voice in the first part of verse 21? They are hurt. They're upset by the death of Christ because they have pinned all their hope on him. They said, we thought this was the one. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. We thought he was going to do this for us. And now, our hope is gone. Our hope is over. We don't know what we're going to do. What does Jesus do? He preaches to them. He preaches himself. I'd have loved to have been there and heard this. It says there in verse 27 that he went from Moses to the prophets, preaching about himself, preaching that he had to suffer, that he had to be crucified, but then that he had to be raised from the dead. That means that he went... From the beginning of the Old Testament to the end. You know what he talked to them about? As they're hurting, as they're conflicted? The resurrection. And then it says in verse 32 that their hearts burned within them when he spoke. They were warmed by this. They were comforted by the resurrection. Folks, we should gather that same, we should glean that same comfort from the resurrection today. We have hope because of his resurrection. The one that we have trusted, the one that we have trusted to redeem us is real. He has been raised, and there is hope, and there is comfort. What comfort do we have because of the resurrection? Well, let me give you three things. The resurrection gives us comfort in life. Life is hard, isn't it? Am I the only one that thinks life is difficult? Life is is a struggle. Things can change in an instant. Things can change in the blink of an eye. A doctor's report, a pink slip from work, divorce papers, things can just whoosh, turn you upside down and put you on your back in an instant. 
But you know what? No matter what we face, we have comfort. We have hope in life. And it's all tied in to the resurrection. You know what the resurrection means for us? It means that Christ dwells within us. It means that we have his strength. It means that we have his power. And that means come what may in our lives, he'll be there. He'll take care of us. The resurrection gives us comfort in life. Another thing that we see, the resurrection gives comfort in death. We're all going to pass, aren't we? One day, the heart's going to stop one day. We'll breathe in and we'll breathe out. But you know what will happen on that day? With Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's because of the resurrection. We have hope in death. No matter how we die, no matter what happens, if you know Jesus, if you have received him, you have hope in death. That means that when you die, you go to be with him. That means that when you die, you have hope of eternal life. But also because of the resurrection, it means that when we die, when we pass on, that there will be a resurrection one day for us. One day. One day we'll have a glorified body. One day we'll have our own resurrection. We have comfort in death because of the resurrection. Something else that we have, another comfort we have, is comfort in eternity. Comfort in eternity. One day, yes, we are going to die, but that's not the end of us. We will go to one of two eternal destinations. It will either be heaven or hell. If you know Jesus by the power of his resurrection, there's comfort in eternity. That means that we will, when we go, we'll go to heaven. We'll be with the Father because of what Jesus for, has done for us on the cross and what we have by the power of his resurrection. Now, I know that many of us are hurting tonight. Many of us are going through struggles. Some are known to each other. Some are private. But I want to tell you this. Whatever your struggle, whatever your trial, whatever your trouble, there is comfort in Christ and his resurrection. Hold on to it. Grasp it. Know it. We've seen two things so far. We've seen that the resurrection confirms the claims of Jesus. We've seen that the resurrection comforts the conflicted. Now, let me share with you a last thing. The resurrection challenges the converts. We're going now to Act 3. We're going to the end part. We've been to the empty tomb. The ladies were there with the angels. Jesus is risen. We've been on the road to Emmaus. Jesus appeared, preached himself from beginning to end of the Old Testament, showing the resurrection. Now we're going to go to that upper room there in Jerusalem. The disciples are gathered there. They're disheartened, they're scared, they're worried. Jesus appears to them. What does he do? Shows the wounds. Look, look at my wounds. Look at the scar on my side. Proves to them that he's raised from the dead. They share a meal. And then he challenges them on the basis of his resurrection to do certain things, to believe certain things, to act a certain way. Look at what he says in verses 45 to 49 he appears to them reveals himself and then he preaches it says then
They wouldn't trust him. They wouldn't believe. So what's he doing right here? He's saying, fellas, you saw me die. You still see the wounds. But I'm here. I'm raised. I'm alive. And then he teaches them from the Old Testament. And he's calling on them, believe. You doubted for so long during my earthly ministry. Now you see me. Believe. Folks, the Lord would have us do the same thing. He'd have us believe on him for salvation, but he would have us believe on him on a daily basis. To believe in him and believe on him. That's what the resurrection does. It challenges us to trust him because the resurrection shows us that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, that all of his claims are real, that what he says is true. So we have to trust him. We have to believe him. Another challenge that we see from the resurrection, the resurrection challenges us to evangelize. To share that story. How many of you believe in the resurrection? Okay. If you believe it. Then what do you have to do? Look at what Jesus says. Verses 47 and 48. He says this. And that repentance and remission of sins. Should be preached in his name. Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. He said you have seen me. You know that I am raised. So you have to share this. He says there in verse 48, you are going to be my witnesses. This is where we get our English word, the Greek word here for witnesses, where we get the English word martyr. Martyr means to bear witness that something is true. True. That's what we have to do because the resurrection is real. We have to evangelize. We have to share the gospel. We have to share that story. And folks, we all raised our hands, didn't we? We all claimed that it was real. That means that we have to share it. The resurrection challenges us to evangelize. One last thing and then I'll close. The resurrection challenges us to obey him. The Lord gave his disciples specific instructions. Look at verse 49. He said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He said, Look, I've got a mission for you. You're going to be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem and going all over the world. But before you can do that, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to wait in Jerusalem. And we know based upon the book of Acts that they obeyed the Lord. But do you realize how difficult that must have been? The chief priests are there, the rulers are there, and they just executed Jesus. Do you think they really like the followers of Jesus? Do you think that they would like to kill them too? Probably. We see in the book of Acts that they did kill some of them. Tried to kill Peter. That'd be hard to go back there. It'd be hard to stay there, wouldn't it? Be very, very difficult. But what do they do? They stay. Why do they do that? Because they see him raised from the dead and they realize who he is. So they obeyed him. Folks, we just said the resurrection is real. You've raised your hand. So that means that we have to obey the Lord. We have to do what he says. We have been thinking about the resurrection. We've been thinking about the hope that it gives us. But I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Looking at the resurrection, have you recognized, man, his claims are real. He's God. He can forgive sin, and he's also coming back as judge. Have you seen that? And in doing so, have you come to Jesus and been saved? If not, I want to give you an opportunity right now. Uh, Brother Larry is going to come. Miss Debbie is going to come. We're going to have a, a hymn of invitation. If you don't know Jesus, will you come today? Will you see the empty tomb? Will you see him raised? And will you give the risen Savior your life 